you are watching The Context. It is time for our regular weekly segment, AI Decoded. Welcome to AI Decoded. If you were with us last week, and I must encourage you to look at our previous episodes on YouTube, then you will have heard us talk about the huge advances at OpenAI and the launch of ChatGPT 4.0. Well, tonight we're going to focus on the one issue that worries us all. Who is in control? Where is the balance between innovation and regulation? And it has been quite the week. On Tuesday, the European Union got serious, setting out the most comprehensive legislation on AI anywhere in the world. Tonight, we'll hear from the woman who played a key role in developing the EU's AI bill, Margareta Vestiger, the European Commission Commissioner for Competition. You know, this idea that you should not regulate technology, because that develops really, really fast, but you should regulate the use of it, that idea is gaining a lot of traction. At the AI Summit in Seoul this week, 16 of the biggest AI developers signed an international agreement that builds on the commitments secured last year at Bletchley Park. The companies from China, America and the Middle East have agreed not to develop or deploy AI models that cannot maintain risk below a certain threshold. EU legislation, a new international agreement, but where is the overlap? with China and the United States, two of the biggest developers, and where do the big powers diverge? We'll get the thoughts tonight of Miles Taylor, who is advising the US Congress. With me here in the studio, our regular AI contributor and author on technology, Stephanie Hare. Hello. Hello. Um, can we talk about the UK and the, the South Korea summit? Um, the British government setting out this new agreement this week. Rishi Sunak said, it's a world first to have so many leading AI companies all agreeing to the same commitments on AI safety. Hmm. How significant do you think it is? Well, I guess it just depends. Again, it's better than nothing, which is where we were back when we had the first AI safety summit here in the United Kingdom in November. That said, it's a question of enforcement. Big tech companies love voluntary self-regulation. Why? Because they can't be sued if they don't maintain their commitments. There's also who's actually watching the watchers, who's checking on what they're doing. They constantly like to say that things are intellectual property, they can't reveal training data. So really what's happening here? It sounds great, but it might just be a pinky promise. If these 16 companies are the market leaders, do their safety commitments control the entire industry? I mean, do, do the smaller developers who use the technology on their platforms, are, are they hemmed in by the protocols that have been agreed this week? Only in so much that it's enforced. So yes, in terms of tone, you would think that that would certainly set the direction of travel. But again, who is putting actual resources, manpower and money to checking all of this? And we all saw you know, very recently with OpenAI and the American actress Scarlett Johansson, her voice being used without her consent. Who was checking that, right? So why did, why did she find out after the AI assistant was revealed, even though she'd already said no, she had to get lawyers to come in to do a cease and desist and now they're doing discovery to find out what training data was used. Who was checking that beforehand? No one. Well, listen, uh, among the 16 signatories are Zipu AI from China and the Technology Innovation Institute from the United Arab Emirates, two signatories from countries that so far have been less than willing to bind their biggest companies to safety regulation. Rishi Sunak says that is the result of the lighter touch the British government has taken. The EU is approaching it in a different way. And this week, the leaders of all 27 countries endorse the new AI legislation. It's much more comprehensive than the light touch voluntary approach that Stephanie's just been talking about that the UK and the US have taken. And one of the key architects of that bill is the EU's competition commissioner, Margareta Vestiger. Yesterday, I went to see her in Brussels. Commissioner, the, the EU's new rules on artificial intelligence were endorsed by the 27 countries on Tuesday. You say it's the global benchmark. Uh, for AI regulation. Why do you think it will have an impact beyond the EU's borders? I think because uh, the choice of regulating the use of technology and only having sort of a, a tight regulatory grip 
when it's something existential for the individual. That approach is something that we shared uh, very early on with the Americans within the Trade and Technology Council, so they have the same approach. It's also the approach that we see with the Canadians who are passing uh, AI legislation, uh, hopefully uh, as we speak. Uh, when I talk with colleagues uh, uh, from other jurisdictions, you know, this idea that you should not regulate technology because that develops really, really fast, but you should regulate the use of it. That idea is gaining a lot of traction. What might surprise people is that this new legislation will not be fully in place until 2026, and we know that AI is growing exponentially. Aren't people bound to ask, what are you doing to address the risk today? And isn't there a danger that Pandora's box is already open by the time this comes into play? Oh, but the Pandora's box is open right now. Uh, I, I don't think one should be fooled about that. So, for instance, we use our digital services uh, legislation, the thing that is going to keep digital services safe for us, that they are not addictive, that they do not promote mental health problems, that they cannot be used to undermine uh, elections. Here we also say to the companies providing these services, well, you need to be extra aware if you fuel this with artificial intelligence. You need to be extra aware about uh, fake uh, products, uh, fake videos. Uh, now that we have an election coming up uh, and we know about the abuse that is going on out there, you need to pay really close attention uh, because uh, due to this legislation, you already have obligations to protect people from fraud, from things that are illegal in member states. So I think uh, that's, and then of course that we have the G7 uh, code of conduct. Uh, we have a lot of commitment from businesses, but of course, commitments is a very different thing from having legislation that obliges you uh, to be careful and, and put safety first in, in critical situations. Can you regulate something that people don't fully understand? I get the impression, even from the AI companies themselves, that this thing is providing breakthroughs, uh, developments that they didn't expect themselves. But I think this is, this is actually quite a, a modest ask that, for instance, if you use AI to decide who would you call for a job interview, who can get a mortgage, uh, what kind of treatment should patients have? Well, you should have a pretty good idea that it's not about your postal code uh, or your gender or your political views that you get this treatment or you get the mortgage or you get the interview for the job. Uh, when you get into that situation, well, then you would need a human in the loop and you would ask for explainability as to why to have this outcome instead of the other one. There's been a lot written in, in the last week or so about the, the so-called doomers at mm. OpenAI, the people who wanted to go more slowly and wanted to see how uh, things operated. They've left the board. Mm. Are, are you at all concerned that profit is being put before safety? Well, I have been working with big tech for 10 years uh, and it ex it's experience based uh, that I have a concern that profit is put uh, before uh, other concerns. Uh, that could be safety, that can be mental health, uh, that can be, uh, you know, normal competition that even as a as a big player that you can be challenged. So so knowing the sector. I think it's really important uh, that the public, uh, that the common good, also have a very stern presence uh, in these companies and are facing these companies with very specific asks in order for this to be safe for us to use. And, and of course, there are sort of the sort of existential risks for humanity when it comes to AI. They are in the future, but not in the too far future. And I think you can better relate to those if you deal with the existential risks for the individual. Because it is an existential risk if you can afford a mortgage, but you cannot have it. If, if you need treatment, but you're not given the right treatment because the algorithm doesn't know you're, that you're a woman and because of that your symptoms are different than what they be, were for a man. So I think if we are careful now, when 
something that is at stake for the individual, we will be much better at preventing things that can sort of undermine how humanity is working. Margareta Vestia talked to me yesterday in Brussels. Two things about that interview that I'd like you to clear up for me. First of all, this idea that you can regulate the technology even though you don't know what's coming. How can you regulate something that even science doesn't know where it's going? I think what you're going to do is you're setting out the guardrails, if you will, for uses. So let's take something like the fork that we all know and love. We don't regulate forks, but I could use a fork to eat a salad or I could potentially use a fork to reach across this table and stab you. Mm. We legislate and regulate stabbing you. We don't regulate the fork. Right. Right. So we want to leave all of the innovation routes open, but what we want to do is make sure that you and I both walk around knowing that I can't harm you. Which With brings me innovation. to my second question. She's suggesting that there, there needs to be a symbiotic relationship between legislators and the developers. Who sits in these companies and says, right, bear in mind there is legislation in Europe now, and they've done it pretty fast. I mean, they've been developing this, like you say, since the pandemic, so mm. quicker than anyone else. But who's saying, you need to look at this law because it, 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 it is relevant to us? Yeah. So it's probably in most companies going to be their chief legal counsel, but you will see in some of the most innovative ones, they will actually have a chief AI officer, just like some have a chief privacy officer. So any company that is looking to really embed AI into their operations, I think we will start to see a trend emerging. They will have a board level person. And they will welcome this because yeah. they have something to work to. Yes. Now, regulation actually makes things very clear what's expected and what is out of scope. Right, so where does that leave then? The United States companies. Coming up after the break, we'll speak to Miles Taylor. He's a US national security expert. He previously worked in the Trump administration as chief of Homeland Security. He is now heavily focused on artificial intelligence, advising all the parties in Congress. We'll see if there's any overlap. Where do these regulatory frameworks diverge? And what does that mean for our safety? Well, Stephanie's just been telling us how important it is for these AI officers that sit on boards to work to rules. But there are no comprehensive federal laws that regulate AI in the United States. No federal obligation on developers, users, operators or deployers of AI systems. But late last year, President Biden did sign an executive order that proposed legislation to address safety, responsible development, civil rights, privacy, all the pertinent areas. Now, Commissioner Vestiger, who we heard from in the first half of the program, she says there has been discussion between the EU and the United States, but how much and how aligned are they on regulation that is coming? Let's bring in Miles Taylor, former Chief of Staff at the US Department of Homeland Security. He's now a tech and security expert who advises lawmakers on AI. Give us the, the broad picture, Miles, would you? Where, where do you think you are in the United States in respect of legislation and regulation? Well, you know, Christian, I actually think the United States and Europe are still quite far apart on this subject. Uh, and, and I'm going to give you an example is you know, right now I'm in Dallas, Texas at Capital Factories Health Supernova. This is a big event of AI CEOs and top officials and others talking about the applications of AI to healthcare. Now, there are folks here from European companies who are used to the conversation about this technology being more heavily regulated and who in conversations today have made the case that that regulation is important for protecting life and safety. But you have a lot of American entrepreneurs here who are talking to government officials and saying, to the contrary, they feel like overly regulating AI, in their view, will keep them from moving forward with life-saving AI breakthroughs that could impact healthcare. So very different perceptions. Now, how does that impact the legislative discussion? Well, you see it right now in Congress, is the U.S. Congress has been very, very slow to do any global broad regulation on artificial intelligence, and instead sen senators have only recently released a framework for how to regulate AI and a framework that's very decentralized when compared to the U uh, European Union, a framework that allows individual regulators that already oversee different sectors of society to regulate AI rather than doing it as uh, a federal government. So uh, big, big differences remain. However, I do think that there will be alignment between the EU 
and the U.S. when it comes to the most sophisticated AI models, those that some might claim could end up being sentient in the coming years. Miles, I'm really curious to hear what you think about whether or not we're going to see states taking a different approach versus the federal level, because states can often move faster than the U.S. federal government. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. In fact, we are already seeing that. So even though the federal government in the United States is moving slowly, a number of states are moving very, very quickly with big AI regulatory schemes. In fact, right now at this very moment, there's a lot of controversy in the United States about what's happening in California. There is legislation proposed in California that would create a very broad regulatory regime for artificial intelligence, one that some of the bigger companies might be comfortable with, but you're seeing smaller companies, what we call little tech, come forward and say they're very concerned about California's regulations because they might not be able to comply with them. They don't have the man hours, the time, the staff to be able to comply uh, with the very, very detailed and prescriptions, a uh, prescriptive bill that came out. But the last note there would be when you have 50 states and all 50 of them have slightly different requirements, it gets incredibly complicated. So as that starts to happen, you will see calls from tech companies for the federal government to step in in a bigger way to try to override those laws so they don't have to deal with a conflicting patchwork of AI regulation. Well, the patchwork's the word. I mean, I was just going to say, we, we, you know, we're talking about an agreement in Seoul. We're talking about EU regulation state by state, sector by sector, as you just explained. It's very fragmented. I'm, I'm, we've sat on a panel before, Miles, where someone has talked about an IAEA style um, agreement among all countries where we sort of have a, an international agreement that brings all this regulation together and someone that sits on the board and, and can sort of regulate around the world. Why are we not going in that direction? Well, you know, I think, Christian, right now it's because we're still in the Wild West of understanding what this technology will and will not do. And in the meantime, builders are moving forward with building. I mean, I'll tell you, just a floor below me where a lot of these uh, startup founders are meeting and talking about their AI technologies, I would suspect that most of them have no idea what's happening in the regulatory conversations in the U.S. or the EU. They're just head down building products. Now, the problem is going to become when some of those amazing founders go try to introduce those products into the marketplace to go benefit people. Well, they may be able to sell in one state and not another. Then they'll run into this regulation and that regulation. And as these consumer AI products start to come to market, those builders, um, those yeah. investors, they'll start to feel the friction. And um, we're starting to see that, aren't we, Stephanie, in, in social media with Apple and, uh, and Google who are running into regulations here in the EU. Yes, and I guess my question for Miles, since we've got you here, is to what extent is the U.S. reluctant to regulate AI because they're worried about China really taking the lead? It has been the most important part of the conversation behind the scenes. Whether it's a Democrat or a Republican member of Congress, right now the fear that the United States could fall behind China is what's keeping legislators who normally favor regulation away from grab, grabbing the regulatory lever. They are concerned that if the United States puts a complicated regulatory architecture in place, that Beijing will speed ahead of Washington when it comes to this topic of innovation. It's been a very dominant part of the conversation behind the scenes, and I would suspect those fears of China keep the United States from doing anything too dramatic when it comes to AI rules. Really fascinating. Uh, keep your comments coming in on some of the things that we're discussing. Um, I'm going to lighten the mood a little. Do you, do you like Pink Floyd, Miles? I love Pink Floyd. Right. Well, Dark anyone, Side of the Moon. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Anyone who knows their music will know that it's 50 years ago this March that Pink Floyd released Dark Side of the Moon. Further evidence that all good things were born in 1973. And to mark that anniversary, the band has invited a new generation of animators to create music videos for any of the album's 10 songs. One of those who responded to that challenge is the Finnish musician and AI creator Nuti Karaja, who has been combining the music with some of the most dystopian ideas that we're facing. Take a look at this. It is set to shine on you, Crazy Diamond.
psychedelic, isn't it? I sat and watched this for some time this afternoon. It's a bit trippy. Uh, let's bring in <laughs> Nuti Kataja, uh, who developed it. It's fantastic, honestly. I've, I've, and it's had nearly a, a million views on YouTube, which tells you how good it is. I, I'm interested what you were feeding into this. I mean, what sort of prompts did you give it? How much of this is you? And how much of this is the AI vision of what our future looks like? You know what? It's uh, I usually try to uh, take the AI kind of take the lead. I mean, I start prompting very simply first. I mean, uh, that song. I mean, uh, uh, Shine On, Crazy Diamond. My idea was first because it's a song about Sid Barrett and his uh, mental uh, issues. I figured out I wanted to first get a big diamond in the kind of gallery settings. And uh, I start molding with the very simple prompts, one word, couple of words, and then start adding up those. And then I uh, start printing uh, things that I like and I uh, start feeding them back to the machine. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I mean, I, what, what really strikes me about this is, is for you as a musician, first and foremost, if you'd have tried to make something like this to promote one of your songs, it would have cost you a fortune, but it looks I mean, it looks five star, this. It's fantastic, isn't it? Does it open up a whole new world for you? Oh, this is amazing, this technology. I always wanted to make uh, videos for my own music, and this is great. And it's also, you know, it's a, I think the visual uh, thing with the music, it's just like I can kind of see what I want to, why, what I want to like, first of all, I hear something and then I see something and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like joins together perfectly. I don't know if you can see it, Miles. It's interesting what you were saying earlier in the program that, you know, Scarlett Johansson, I think Stephanie mentioned it as, as suing a, a open AI because a voice that has appeared that is a little bit like hers. And she says, uh, you know, uh, she didn't want them using it. And yet on the flip side, you've got Pink Floyd who were really happy to, to use their music to encourage this kind of creativity. And I just wonder in the realm of what we've just been talking about, regulation, whether that complicates things. It, well, it does. Look, the intellectual property component of this is what's going to cause a lot of these different issues to come to the fore. And intellectual property is a, it's, you know, look, that's a legal challenge that's as old as legal challenges uh, themselves and uh, old as the law is itself. People uh, claiming someone else stole their work. And so you're going to see that happen uh, a lot when these models are used for creative purposes. But I will say, this is a very impressive product. And there was another one just the other week is the band Washed Out came out with a song called The Hardest Part and they used Sora, OpenAI's video algorithm, to make the first AI powered uh, music video. And I'll have to confess, it was quite remarkable and affecting. So I think you're going to see people feel uneasy, but also pretty excited about this moment. Yeah, I don't think I want to live in this dystopian world. <laughs> there's, some pretty, there's some pretty scary stuff in there, Nuti, but it is a fantastic piece. Listen, we're up against the break. Uh, we're out of time. Thank you to Stephanie. Thank you to Miles and Nuti. We'll be here same time next Thursday. Hope you'll join us for that. <laughs>